All right, welcome back, everybody. In this lecture, we're going to be looking at the second half of behaviorism that we discussed in our previous lecture. It's the topic of what we call operant conditioning. And just so we have some context on what we're going to be looking at, I thought I'd review what it was we covered in our previous lecture. So obviously, in our previous class, we spent a lot of time looking at just what this basic branch of psychology called behaviorism was. And we talked about their goals, some of their attempts to try to understand things through their methodology. And we also talked about how when trying to understand a lot of our behaviors, the vast majority of it can sort of be whittled down in behavioral terms to the concepts of learning, and in particular, two different types of learning. In our last class, we spent a lot of time talking about the first type of learning that was explored by behaviors, classical conditioning. But in that class, we talked about how that particular type of learning was insufficient to explain all the different behaviors that we displayed. We mentioned how classical conditioning might be able to explain some of our more automatic involuntary responses to things but if we wanted to look at why we did the certain things we chose to do in certain situations we need a different type of learning to explain it that's what we're going to be looking at today when we explore operant conditioning before we get into operant conditioning though much like before we got into classical conditioning I do want to provide us with sort of a historical note so we can understand where operant conditioning came from and how it expanded within the field. To have that historical note, we actually have to start a little bit before the very famous name in operant, skin, uh, in operant conditioning named B.F. Skinner that we'll talk about a little bit later, and instead focus on a very intriguing kind of unique individual within the history of behaviorism named Edward Thorndike who in the early 1900s, as the behaviorism movement was starting to pick up, decided to try to understand where a lot of our novel kind of unique behaviors could come from. So what he did to understand these behaviors was devise his own mechanism for studying behaviorism. And his most commonly used mechanism was this thing that you see pictured here in the right hand corner called a puzzle box. These puzzle boxes were about as large as a bread box, at least large enough for a cat to be put in them. And he actually had a number of different puzzle boxes he used, but all of them had some similar criteria to them. All of them had numerous random apparatus connected to it. And in addition to that, they had some type of way out. And there was always one apparatus within the puzzle that got them out. Okay, so say for example, in this particular box, maybe pushing at that red bar was the thing that triggered a latch to the door that allowed the cat to get out. And you would take cats, put them in these puzzle boxes, and to understand unique behavior and try to understand some other components to why we did the things we did, he'd just record the actions of these cats in his attempts to come up with these different, what he called laws of behavior or laws of actually instrumental learning was his term he used. And he did come up actually with a number of laws that had some intuitive sense to them. It made them made him somewhat popular within the field at the time. Um, but there was one in particular that we're gonna focus on in this class. I do wanna, just so we can understand some of his laws, mention some other ones before we get to the big one. One of them was something called the law of recency, which suggested that most animals, including cats, are sort of creatures of habit. So with his cats, when he would put them in these boxes, he tended to find that if, say, there was the same apparatus in one box and the next, and the cat had done something with that apparatus in the first box, then there was a really good chance that the cat would probably do something with that same thing in the next box. And if that particular behavior was not possible, in the next box, then the chances of that happening again in another box where that was present, well, that started to decrease. This idea can be seen in lots of our daily reflections where we do lots of things that, that kind of follow this law of recency. My favorite example is when we get ourselves into a routine when it comes to, say, meals or restaurants that we go to. 
Some of you might have found yourself suddenly going to a restaurant that you haven't been to in a while and all of a sudden going in a very regular routine to that place. And then maybe something happens where they close for a week or two or, or something occurs in your schedule and all of a sudden that thing that you had started to go to on a regular basis drops out of your regular repertoire. That's what the law of recency is all about. Essentially, if we have that consistency, we tend to do the thing that we've done recently, even if it doesn't necessarily provide the best outcome, we're just creatures of habit. And once those things are broken, well, we can sort of fall off on doing those things again. Another thing that he found, which is a very intuitive thing, is this thing that he called the law of availability. It essentially said that when we're doing behaviors, there's certain things that are able to come out of us a little bit more easily than others. So for his cats, yeah, potentially doing a backflip in that crate was a possibility, but it wasn't a random repertoire that these cats were displaying. More often than not, they'd be scratching at things or biting at things in their attempts to get out because, well, that was just a part of a normal cat's repertoire. Again, these laws have some intuitive sense to them, and all of the laws that he devised, which were more than just the three that you see listed here, definitely had some utility, and we still use it in some areas of behaviorism today. But the law that really put Thorndike on the map was something that was called the law of effect. And it was a very intuitive and a straightforward law that he came up with. He argued that when a cat found themselves in one of these puzzle boxes and they did something that got them out, that behavior was much more likely to occur again in the future. If they did something in a puzzle box and it didn't get them out, well, that behavior was less likely to occur in the future. Again, it seems very straightforward. We do things that provide us with positive consequences more often. And we don't do things that provide us with any good consequences as often after we find out that they're not going to get us that consequence we're hoping for. But this law of effect, many behaviors started to argue, when paired with classical conditioning, might actually give us a really good sense of where a lot of our behaviors are coming from, again, just by looking at things on the surface level. And the champion of this idea, the one that really promoted the law of effect and eventually started kind of making it his own, was the famous behaviorist that I've alluded to a couple times before. He was the one that talked about the term radical behaviorism. He's considered one of the founding fathers of behaviorism and actually still to this day is a contributor to many behavioral concepts and ideas. It was a gentleman named B.F. Skinner who in the early-ish 1900s, 1920s, 1930s, designed his own apparatus to study behaviorism and, and learning, and he called these things operant chambers. And the operant chambers originally were really designed just to build off the ideas of Thorndike and his law of effect. He created these different things that animals put in these operant chambers could do, like press a lever or press a disc or maybe push their beak against a specific light. And from those behaviors, he would give these animals that were put in these things rewards or punishments, uh, things that they found desirable or things that they would not find desirable, like food or shocks. And from these basic things, he started to set up the principles of what he called operant learning, and what we sometimes today call operant conditioning. So what is operant conditioning? Operant conditioning, as we've alluded to before, is oftentimes called consequence learning. And that's because what we're learning in operant conditioning is the consequences that are associated with specific behaviors in certain situations. And from those consequences, we're learning to do those behaviors or more or less in those situations. Skinner himself often called this the ABCs of learning, where we would have an A antecedent, some environment like you sitting in class or you having a conversation with a friend or you watching a movie, whatever it is, this, this antecedent, this environment we find ourselves in, a behavior that we decide to commit, 
for random reasons or you know, for, for some very good justified reason, whatever it is, there's a behavior that we commit and there's a consequence to that behavior. If the consequence is desirable, we're going to probably do that behavior more often the next time we find ourselves in that antecedent or situation. If it's undesirable, we will probably do that behavior less the next time we find ourselves in that situation. Again, even if it's just random or something we plan to do, these consequences should have these robust effects. And what Skinner's work focused on in operant conditioning is the nature of the consequences. He really honed in on what he eventually called reinforcement and punishment, labeling anything that causes us to do a behavior more as reinforcement and anything that gets us to do a behavior less in a situation as punishment. Uh, we tend to have our own intuitive ideas of what makes something a reinforcement and what makes something a punishment. We sometimes talk about desirable or undesirable or something that, you know, we, we need to restore some type of equilibrium or something we find intrinsically valuing. Skinner tried to stay away from that. He just said, look, I want to look at the behavior. I want to say if I see that behavior occurring more often as a result of a consequence, then that behave that consequence regardless of what it is we like it or don't or you know we, we can really pinpoint the, the nuances to why it's a consequence it, it doesn't matter he said it's it's going to be defined if we're doing something more as a reinforcement if we're doing something less again we don't care if you like it or don't like it we're going to call that consequence a punishment because you seem to be doing that behavior less in that antecedent or that situation as a result of the consequence itself uh, Skinner had about 70 years to expand on this idea, and he was able to break this down in much more formulaic ways, giving these new f ideas of reinforcement and consequence nuances to them. One of the first ideas that he added to his basic principles of reinforcement and punishment was the notion of what he called positive and negative components to reinforcement and punishment. Uh, these are oftentimes sort of confusing for incoming freshmen or people that haven't had much exposure to psychology, but it is a very formulaic idea when he introduced the terms. He argued that any time a consequence involves something being added to the environment, again, it doesn't mean that it has to be good or bad or, or anything. It's just if it's something being added, we're going to call that consequence positive. If something is being taken away or, or just nothing is happening as a consequence to a behavior, then we're going to call that consequence negative. This allowed for both punishment and reinforcement to have positive and negative components to them. So you could have positive punishment where something's being introduced and that thing that's being introduced is causing you to do that behavior in that situation where that thing was introduced more often. Or you could have negative reinforcement where you're doing something more in a situation, but the consequence to that behavior wasn't that something was added as much as something was taken away or something didn't happen. Uh, a great example of positive reinforcement would be, say, getting money to do your homework. I mean, you do something after somebody's asked you to do it. That's the antecedent, being asked to do it. Or maybe you get an assignment and all of a sudden, when you commit the behavior with that antecedent present, boom, you magically get money afterward. You're probably going to do your homework a little bit more if that occurs. Now, yes, we think of money usually as a good thing. Most of us tend to prefer it over no money, but that's not the thing that makes it positive, right? It's the introduction of that money, the fact that it came up as a consequence, that makes it positive. An example of negative reinforcement would be, say, uh, the, the, the kind of removal of pain that happens when we take a specific medication. So let's say we're feeling all achy or tired, and this antecedent leads us to look for options, right? We could go to sleep, we could get a massage, or we could take medicine. And let's say we take the medicine route. Well, our taking the medicine isn't necessarily introducing a new stimulus. It's actually reducing, they're removing the stimulus of the pain. Hence the reason why we call it negative. Again, it doesn't mean that the medicine's a bad thing per se. It's just 
the pain's going away, therefore we're going to define it as negative. An example of positive punishment is the, the classic bark collar that you sometimes see dog trainers use, where if an antecedent of, say, a male person or a neighbor or just some random sound on the street is causing a dog to bark, well, that dog, when they bark after hearing that thing, will often get hit with a very undesirable shock or maybe a squirt of water to the face. That shock or squirt of water to the face will make the dog probably less inclined to bark the next time it sees the male person or the, the random stranger on the street. But it, it's uh, something that's happening, the lack of barking is happening as a result of something being introduced. So therefore we call it, and this is rather counterintuitive, positive punishment. Positive because again, the, the squirt of water or the shock is being introduced after the behaviors occurred but punishment because behaviors occurring less frequently in that environment is a result of that consequence. Negative punishment, which is oddly enough the one I think most students tend to relate to after, well, I guess second most common one that they can relate to after positive reinforcement, is when a removal or something is taken away after behaviors occurred in order to get that behavior to occur less often. Yeah, the classic example of this in, in parenting or education is some type of, of consequence, something being taken away if, if some behavior occurs. You know, a teacher takes away points in a class if a student talks, or uh, you might have a swear jar at home where if you commit a behavior when you're upset or you commit a behavior when you're talking with your friends, uh, those consequences to that is money is taken from you in that situation. These are the four, again, types of punishment and reinforcement that Skinner started to look at. And being able to break those down into a formula was something that many people trying to understand behaviorism started to strive to do because they realized that there was some intuitive nature to this. Right, we could explain why people were doing things just on these basic surface terms just by using these concepts. And to understand how it works, I thought we would look very quickly at two examples. So you see here in this slide, a young boy named Danny, who's apparently spilled something in a bowl that's spilling all over the place. And his diet has decided to operantly condition the fact that Danny has chosen to cry after spilling that bowl. So he pushes a button and this button activates a lever that bangs against the door. And you see the whoop, whoop, whoop sound that the, the mallet is making on the door. And he says to his child, uh-oh, Danny, sounds like the monster in the basement has heard you crying again. Let's be real quiet and hope he goes away. Uh, it, let's not judge the, the parenting behavior of the father. Let's just focus on how Skinner or behaviors would define what the father's doing. I want you to take a second and see if you can identify what he's doing. My hope is, if you pause for a second, you first realize that he's trying to get the behavior to occur less often, therefore it's defined as punishment. And you, my hope is also that you've realized that the consequence is something is being introduced when he was committing that behavior, the crying. Therefore, and this seems weird, but that is a version of positive punishment. I always like to have this example because it does tend to throw students for a loop on occasion. And it really highlights how, even though these terms might seem counterintuitive, they easily fit together in this behavioral model of operant conditioning. Positive because something was introduced as a consequence of the behavior, in this case, the behavior is crying. And punishment because, well, the next time he spills something, he's probably less inclined to cry after he's encountered this consequence. Let's look at this one. Now, there's lots of different ways we could go, but let's focus on how the child might be operantly conditioning the father here. So the child is crying and screaming and yelling, and the father decides just randomly to not take a pacifier and put it in the child's mouth, but maybe put the pacifiers in his own ears. Again, let's not judge the parenting of the father here. Let's just look at what this father might have actually experienced in terms of operant conditioning as a result of this experience. So let's look at it. What do you think if a behaviorist was going to explain his behavior, 
we would define this experience as. And this one might seem a little counterintuitive. So if this works, if he doesn't get yelled at a lot, my guess is he'd probably do this again the next time his daughter cries, especially if it's more effective than any other techniques. And the fact that he would do it more often in this situation automatically makes this particular consequence a reinforcement. And the fact that when he does this, that annoying crying and screaming goes away makes this odd behavior and odd decision negative. So we would call this, in this very odd scenario, negative reinforcement. I know some of you got this. I also am sure that some of you did not understand it. But I promise, if you take the time to break it down and understand the ABCs, it works really, really well. And there is no gray zone in these examples. It might seem like there's gray zone, but there really isn't. Because all we're looking at in behaviorism is identifying an antecedent, looking at the observable overt behavior, and defining the consequences based on is something in the consequence being introduced, taken away, nothing's happening. And in this case, you know, is this as a result of this thing being taken away or introduced or not happening, is this is going to be happening more often or less often in this scenario. This is all operant conditioning was about. From it sprang all these other ideas that Skinner and others looking at behaviorism started to explore. One of the things that behaviors did when trying to expand upon the, the basic terminology tied to operant conditioning was find ways to link some of the classical conditioning ideas that we talked about in the last class to these new operant conditioning terms. One thing we talked about in classical conditioning was this idea of extinction. How if we broke the tie between the conditioned stimulus and the unconditioned stimulus, we could find a way to get that conditioned stimulus to revert back to a neutral one. Well, for extinction and operant conditioning, we're breaking ties, but in this case, we're breaking the ties between the behavior and consequences in a certain antecedent. So let's say we were trying to get somebody to do something more through some type of reinforcement, be it positive or negative. Well, we could, if we want to make that behavior happen less often, they become extinct, just stop providing that reinforcement. Let's, you know, stop making the medicine work, or let's find a way to stop paying somebody for doing something. And in that case, sounds are pretty good, that behavior is just going to occur less frequently. Same thing with punishment. We just stop punishing a behavior if it's exhibited in a certain situation. So let's say your parents stopped taking away money from you every time you swore. Well, extinction would occur, but it's really important to note when we're talking about extinction in punishment, that it's not that that behavior suddenly becomes the only thing we do or it goes away. What we're talking about here is that that behavior returns back to something called baseline, where we're essentially swearing as much as we would without that consequence of the punishment being incurred. Now, extinction is one of the terms that we looked at with classical conditioning, but certainly not the only one. We also talked about generalization and discrimination. In classical conditioning, it was more about the stimuli that were similar to the condition stimulus. And we, if we generalized, would react to these new stimuli in the same way as we reacted to the original stimulus. If we discriminated, we were essentially reacting to this new stimulus, even if it was similar to the original one, as if it were not the same. We treated it as a new neutral stimulus, not a conditioned stimulus. In operant conditioning, that doesn't make sense. So instead, we talk about whether or not we generalize or discriminate based on the response, and based on the environments or the antecedents. Most research that was focused on the response, generalization, and discrimination that can occur. Where if, say, we're reinforced for one behavior, we might do a bunch of other behaviors that are similar to that one. Now, let's say you get money for getting good grades on your homework or doing your homework. 
well, you might come to the conclusion that you're going to maybe also get money if you do your dishes and if you pick up your room and if you do other things that maybe are considered desirable by your parents. And that's a situation where just one behavior being reinforced is generalized to other behaviors in the hopes that maybe those will also be reinforced in that situation. We call it response generalization. We're very peculiar, though, and say just this one thing is going to change because I think that's the one thing being reinforced. We're not doing anything else. We're engaging in what's called response discrimination. It's, it's not that we're being mean to the response or doing something unfair to it, where we're just saying this one response is the only one I'm going to change my rate of as a result of the consequences I'm encountering. And again, this works not only for reinforcement, but it also works for punishment or maybe we might stop doing something that's similar to something we're already stopping through punishment. Or we might say, you know, this one thing is the only thing I'm going to stop. In that case, we're, again, discriminating in the, the punishment phase. These types of ideas allowed operant conditioning to kind of expand into other areas and grow, but it also led people to recognize that we could go beyond just these basic one-to-one -one connections between some classical conditioning terms and operant conditioning terms, and actually expand upon the basic principles of operant conditioning to really understand how it bleeds in to so many different aspects of our lives. One of the things that people started looking at when it became really apparent that we could use this information for animal behaviorism and for the modification of specific actions is whether or not we could kind of get or coax very elaborate behaviors out of different animals or even human beings through operant conditioning. And it led to the introduction of something that we nowadays call shaping, where maybe we don't wait for a specific behavior to occur, but Instead, we reinforce approximations of a behavior, leading closer and closer to the specific behavior we want. You know, a classic example is getting a dog to roll over. Not a lot of dogs are just randomly rolling over on any given day, but if you could say, first, reinforce a dog for laying down when you present some antecedent, like lifting up a treat or saying a word, well, then you're starting that process towards getting to roll over. Then maybe after they lay down, you only reinforce them if they're, say, laying down and turning to their side. And maybe you only reinforce them a little bit more when not only do they lay down and turn to their side, but get to their back and well, you understand the next couple steps until you get to a point where you can get a dog to roll over and reinforce that one particular behavior that would have never occurred on its own. And we call that process, again, shaping. Another really interesting avenue that people started to explore is how powerful the combination of operant and classical conditioning can be. One of the things that people often do is differentiate between these things called primary and secondary reinforcers when trying to understand what's the catalyst behind behaviors that are elicited. Primary reinforcers are essentially reinforcers that work on their own. No learning, no extra things have to take place. Secondary reinforcers are reinforcers that only work through some type of experience. Usually the experience we focus on here is classical conditioning. My favorite example of secondary reinforcement is something you might have encountered somewhere in your childhood or maybe at some point in your early adulthood. This wonderful thing called clicker trainings for dogs. If you've never seen clicker training, I, I would encourage you just to check it out and see how unbelievably well it works. And it is kind of an odd thing if you don't understand the principles of behavior. So what you do in clicker, tra clicker training is essentially classically condition a dog to learn that a clicker or some type of sound is synonymous with getting food. So in the early stages of clicker training with dogs, they are very happy and content with what's going on. All they do is go about their business, and every now and then, the trainer will click their random clicker or make some specific sound and immediately hand the dog food. Nothing is required to get this, and in fact, for it to work, you're not supposed to give something in particular, or you're not supposed to actually ask for something in particular. Uh, you, you're just giving food or giving some type of reinforcement at the sound of this clicker. And then, what starts to happen, as you start to introduce the, the, the operant conditioning portion to it. 
So you ask the dog to do something, and sometimes you'll give the dog, when it does this thing, food. Other times you'll just play the clicker. And if the dog has started to establish the connection between the clicker and the food, the clicker can suffice as being a reinforcer. The dogs can, oddly enough, be very happy when they hear that clicker. And this is extremely valuable for animal training because it allows the animals to stay focused when they hear the click, but still feel like they've been reinforced for doing a specific behavior. If you've ever given food to a dog, you probably have appreciated the fact that dogs stop thinking the first second that food tends to be presented to them. They forget why they're getting the food and what they need to do in the future to get it. They just want to get that food in their mouth as soon as possible. This is where this pairing, again, of classical conditioning and operant conditioning becomes very valuable. We also see this in our real lives. Right? Most of us think of money as a primary reinforcer, but most researchers have actually argued that money is an example of a secondary reinforcer. Right? Money is the thing that gets us those other things that we find reinforcing, you know, be it video games or uh, some type of food that we like or, or some type of other thing that we derive pleasure from. So even though we think of money oftentimes as the prime thing that we're driven for, really, in behavioral terms, money is simply a secondary reinforcer that just works really, really well because of how strongly we tie it to all these other primary reinforcers in our life. Now, this idea of applying real life to some of the basic models that were discovered in operant conditioning leads me to another really interesting topic that Skinner and others started to explore. It was based on the recognition that even though Skinner's uh, boxes, what he called operant chambers and we nowadays call Skinner boxes, were ingenious and they allowed us to understand the principles of operant conditioning in a very interesting way, they weren't always reflective of reality. As in the lab, Skinner or other behaviorists could ensure that every time a specific behavior occurred, it would be reinforced. In the real world, we don't always have that ability. We don't always get to as teachers reinforce you for reading the book when you're supposed to or watching a video when you're supposed to. Parents don't always get to praise their children when they do the things that they want them to do. Reinforcement oftentimes comes few and far between, and oftentimes also punishment comes few and far between. And what behavior started to wonder was what that does to behavioral patterns when you don't have that certainty in place. So one of the first places we went was to define what Skinner's operant chambers were doing. Many people went on to contend that the rats in his chambers and other animals that we put in them were on what we call a continuous reinforcement schedule, where every time they did something, without fail, they'd get reinforced for that behavior. Then what behaviors did was they started to mess with what patterns of reinforcement could be used to get that behavior to occur, but not ensure that every time that behavior occurred, a reinforcement would appear. Now, if you take a behaviorism class, you'll learn about dozens of different schedules that are out there and a lot of different ways that you can create weird patterns of responses in animals through these different types of what we call reinforcement schedules. But in this class, I thought we'd just focus on some of the really popular ones that behaviorists usually first looked at. These particular types of schedules, what we again call partial or interwritten reinforcement schedules, fit into two general categories, what we call ratio schedules and interval schedules. Ratio schedules are based on a certain number of responses being required before a reinforcement occurs. And interval schedules are based on, again, a behavior needing to occur for reinforcement happening. In this case, a certain amount of time has to pass before that behavior is reinforced. Ratio schedules can actually happen in two forms. You can have fixed ratio schedules where a certain number of responses have to occur before reinforcement is handed out, and variable or interval schedules where, or sorry, variable ratio schedules where you could have maybe an average number of times that something has to happen, but it varies, as the name implies, from moment to moment as to how many responses need to occur before reinforcement is administered. For example, in, in Skinner's chambers, we could give a rat a 
piece of food every time it presses a bar five times. Or we could say, well, you know, let, let's set up the computer so about every fifth time reinforcement's going to occur, but maybe sometimes the ratchet has to press the lever three times, and maybe sometimes eight times, and five times, and two times. And it just varies from session to session as to how many times the lever needs to be pressed. So every time that reinforcement comes, the rat doesn't know how many times it needs to respond the next time before reinforcement is administered. Well, when Skinner and other behaviors put rats in these operant chambers or Skinner boxes and looked at how they behaved, they gave these very predictable behavioral patterns that many people started to say were reflective of what we saw in the real world. When rats were put on what we call fixed ratio schedules, they'd respond a set number of times until they got the reinforcement, and then they'd almost always display these things that we call post-reinforcement pauses where they just sit there sort of staring at the food, maybe eating it, maybe nibbling on it, but not pushing the lever. When these same rats were put on what was called a variable ratio schedule, they behave very differently. One might think, if we looked at the fixed ratio schedule, that the pauses that these rats were displaying was a byproduct of them being tired after, say, having to press a lever five or ten times or however many times before they were going to get a reinforcement. But when these same rats were put on the variable ratio schedule, well, we could say, you know, we need an average of five times or ten times before they're going to get a reward, but they don't know how often they get the reward, that, that we'd see the same thing, but we didn't. In labs, what we tend to see is that rats actually press the lever frantically throughout the entire session when they realize that they're on these variable ratio schedules. And oftentimes when they get the reinforcement, they don't pause at all. They just keep hacking away on that lever sometimes grabbing the food with one hand while pushing the lever with the other. Many researchers have argued we see this in real life examples all the time. One of my favorite examples are those wonderful food card punches that many of us probably have in our purses or wallets or whatever you use to carry your credit cards and other things. Most of us probably have something like a Starbucks card or a McDonald's card. I don't think they have those. But anyways, you understand the gist of it, where you go to a certain place in a certain number of times. And after that, a certain number of times has passed, you get reinforced like through a free coffee or something else that, that you get for free as a reinforcement of going a certain number of times. Most of us, when we get that reinforcement, tend to think that that's going to entice us to go back to those stores more. But if we look at your behavior on an overt level, what we tend to see is you, much like the rats, engage in these post-reinforcement pauses. You cherish that free coffee or that free sandwich or whatever it is. You bragged everybody about how wonderful it is. But then after you eat it, you usually don't go back to that place quite as often. Now, if you're set and that's every, something you do every day, this doesn't really apply, but if you aren't 100% consistent for other reasons, most of us behave just like those rats, where we don't go back right away. We engage in that pause, and it's not until after that pause that we get back on that wheel and start doing that thing that we know is eventually going to get reinforced. Have you ever seen somebody at a slot machine in Vegas or Reno or somewhere in our area? You can appreciate the effect, efficacy of the variable ratio schedule where if we know we're going to get reinforced for behavior, we don't know how often we need to respond before that reinforcement comes out, we can get ourselves addicted very quickly. And this also works for those interval schedules that we talked about before. Remember, we talked about how interval schedules are based on a certain amount of time needing to pass before a behavior we commit is then reinforced. And just like we can have fixed and variable ratio schedules, we can also have fixed and variable interval schedules. Fixed interval schedules essentially are schedules where a certain amount of time has to pass, a set time has to pass, before a behavior is reinforced. Variable interval schedules are ones where we could say we need an average of a certain amount of time to pass, but that time passing varies from session to session as to how much has to pass before reinforcements administered. And just like we saw there being behavioral differences in fixed and variable ratio schedules, we also see in labs 
very dramatic behavioral differences in fixed and variable interval schedules. When rats are put on fixed interval schedules, they display something that's sort of similar to the fixed ratio schedule where they have these really interesting pauses that occur after they get reinforced. And once a rat's learned that they're not going to necessarily get reinforced until after a certain amount of time has passed, they don't just pause for a short period of time, but instead they pause for an extremely long period of time. And in the lab, since rats don't quite know exactly how much time has to pass, but can get a very good rough estimate of how much time is going to pass, they start to display these weird behaviors that you see pictured in the lower right-hand corner of that image called scallops where there's these long pauses and when the rat starts to think it's about time for them to get the reinforcement they start pressing the lever they start pressing more and more and more and faster and faster and faster and faster and frantically when they think they're certain they're going to get it very any second and then when they get the reinforcement they get that big pause and that lull a long amount of time where they just sit there and do nothing until they're getting closer to that estimated time and it starts to pick up and up and up and they get faster and faster and faster and faster and faster and frantic until again they get that reinforcement and there's a long pause again you might think this is a fatigue thing but when rats are on the variable interval schedules they don't display that fatigue they consistently press the bar just check in every couple seconds is this the time for me to get that reinforcement is it now that i need to press this lever and again, just like we can relate these ratio schedules to real life examples in human beings, we can relate these interval schedules to real life examples in human beings. Unfortunately, much to the bemoan of many instructors, most of you right now are on the fixed interval schedule. We have to tell you usually when your tests are, when your assignments are due. I think students would revolt if they signed up for a class where the instructor said, you know, I'm just going to text you randomly at some point during this week and say, you know, turn in this question or do this thing. My students like to know what's due and when it's due. And unfortunately, as a result of that desire to know, a lot of you behave, unfortunately, much like the rats. Or you've got these pauses between things that are due and things that you're going to be assessed on. And you're not doing much. And when you get closer to those things that are due, you start picking up the pace. Many good students in our four-year colleges, when they get to those ends, behave frantically, just like the rats do in the labs, to where they're exhausting themselves by pressing so hard. And then when that reinforcement comes out, when that test is administered or the paper's finally turned in, we pause just like the rats and have those long delays. There have been some instructors, if you're wondering, that have put students on these variable interval schedules where they've said, you don't know when you come in if you're going to have a quiz. You don't know if you're going to have a paper that you have to write in class. Just keep coming. And we'll see how things go. And students tend to behave the same way the rats do on the variable interval schedules, where they're constantly active, constantly doing stuff, never going frantic. And in the long run, accomplishing pretty much the same goal, same amount of effort. Uh, some of you might be asking why instructors don't do this then if it's less stress. Uh, much like the rats in labs, students tend to prefer being on fixed interval schedules. Rats prefer being on fixed interval schedules. When they're given the two options with two different levers that they can choose between, they tend to go for the fixed interval schedules themselves. Why this is the case is sort of a mystery, but you know it really highlights how, again, behaviorism can be found in lots of different things. And if we expand the scope of what we're looking at, we can see principles of this idea of operant conditioning found in every single experience that we have. Another area that people have looked into when trying to apply operant conditioning is in education. There's lots of research when we look at education and child rearing that suggests that even if we're not trying to be behaviorists, a lot of the things we do fit into the behavioral realm. And a lot of the things that we can alter in labs are things we can alter in the real world. And 
the effects are pretty much the same. For example, what we see with rats and what we see with humans is just like with classical conditioning, immediacy is really important. If we want to get a behavior to occur more or less, the reinforcement or punishment has to happen almost instantly after the behaviors occurred. If there's a long delay, much like we saw in long delays with classical conditioning, the learning just doesn't take place. We also see, if we're looking at child rearing and work with animals, that if we want to create more elaborate behaviors, I want to incur, say, shaping, reinforcement is significantly more effective over the long run than punishment. Now, it is worth noting that if we need to suppress a very specific behavior, punishment can be an effective tool. Again, punishment is not being horribly mean. In behavioral terms, it just means taking something away to get a behavior to, or sorry, it means getting a behavior to occur less. Sorry, I'm talking about negative punishment. I digressed there. Punish just means about getting something to happen less, right? Getting that behavior to happen less because it's undesirable can work. But if you're trying to create child rearing activities to get a child to be more successful in school or better with their peers, reinforcing the desirable behaviors has proven to be much more effective. What we've also seen in labs is that even though Skinner and many researchers focus their attention on conditioning one animal at a time, numerous studies have shown that not only can the conditioned animal learn, but the conditioned animal being watched can actually cause the observers to learn through the, the, the animal that's being conditioned. Numerous studies have shown that rats, dogs, uh, cats, a variety of species can be what we call vicariously conditioned, where they can learn the reinforcement or punishment of other animals. And we see this in numerous instances in our academic settings and in our parent rearing or child rearing, not parent rearing. Numerous studies have shown that even though most of our focus tends to be on one-to-one -one learning, a large portion of our learning in our everyday experience actually comes from the observed learning that we see of others. And, and this is just scratching the surface of all the different places that we've been able to see applications of operant conditioning in. It's also probably important to reiterate here that, again, operant conditioning does not explain everything. It's just an attempt to explain where our intentional, desired, volitional behaviors are coming from. We're looking at the, the source of automatic, uncontrolled behaviors. Operant conditioning doesn't work very well. And in fact, there are some situations, even when we're talking about things that you've decided to do, where operant conditioning isn't perfect. But in conjunction with classical conditioning, I hope you now have a better understanding of how behaviorists can try to understand a lot of nuances to humans in very scientific ways, something that we really did strive to do in the 1920s. And if you've got that understanding, hopefully you can now appreciate the behaviorism movement a little bit more. And that means we can move our attention to other areas of psychology, we call them other areas of cognitive psychology, and we will. Just before that, we've got some other stuff that we have to take care of. So I encourage you to make sure that you're looking over all of the different slides that we've gone through so far. Make sure that you've looked at the syllabus and know exactly what you need to do because we are on the precipice of something big. And I wanna make sure that everybody's prepared for that. So I'm going to bid you adieu, but please, when you're done with this, check out where you're at because, well, it's about time for you to be conditioned. So I'm going to wish you a good day and hopefully see many of you soon. Take care.